This, I suppose, is personal to me. I did an exhibition called Diaspora, and it's about this question that people often get asked, where are you really from? Or people say, go back to your country. But my mum is white and from Stoke-on-Trent, and my dad's West African from Ghana, so I have a bit of a problem going back to my country. I'm Veronica Lindsay Addy, I'm a Londoner, a carer for a family member, and when I have the time, an artist, a jack of all trades artist as I put it, I might paint, draw, sew even. At the moment I'm making aprons out of clothes I found discarded in the street. I like the stories behind things, so each apron will have a name and maybe a little story behind it. I'm always looking at everything that's around me. For instance, I saw cans carefully arranged on walls, my wall, other walls. So that gave me my inspiration and I created a series of little portraits of basically litter. I mean, they make it look quite pretty, but who wants to look at really disgusting things? I like pretty things. I worked as a special needs assistant. I found art was really, really useful. We just draw, like one day they were doing the topic of water, and we just drew everything to do with water, and we took it in turns, raindrops and swimming and clouds. Really, art can be another language. Later in life, I was approaching 50, and I suddenly thought, oh, I'm a grown up. I don't have a dad telling me what to do. So this is my opportunity. So when I was thinking, oh, I'd like to do some art, Waltham Forest Adult Education College had advertised a foundation in art and design. I thought that's brilliant and it's local. So that's why I went along there. I worked with Waltham Forest carers using art in a therapeutic way. A lot of people haven't done art since school and they just thought, oh, this is fun, you know, takes me back to childhood, more carefree time. It's quite good. If you're focused on the art, people could let go of something that was upsetting them and no other people understood. I wasn't very confident about launching an exhibition and I didn't necessarily know how to go about it. The art trail gave me the confidence and then the rest is history because once I participated once and really enjoyed it, I carried on from there on. I think it is a very sociable event and it's good for a lot of people. There's no rhetoric behind my work. The subject itself is the experience of making it and the experience of the, the viewer viewing it. it. It's their emotional response. Because the artwork changes depending on where the viewer is in relation to the artwork, the more the viewer looks, the greater the reward. My name's Tony Blackmore. I'm a visual artist living in Walthamstow. I specialise in making hand-folded reliefs out of drafting film and photographic lighting gels. How I start every piece of work is with an initial drawing. I then lay the drafting film on top where I score lines and then I individually fold over each line. Usually I make large white works, but over the last year I've been using colour. I thought it would be a great idea to show these colour works in the art trail. What I really like about this work in colour is that with the colour work, the nominal colour appears to change depending on your point of view or the light source. For the art trail, I'll be showing these in my gazebo gallery in the garden. People will be able to pick them up to have some physical interaction with them and to see how the colours change with the light. I first became involved in the Arts Trail in 2015 when I moved to Walthamstow. I ended up turning the house into a gallery. We were open for two weekends. We had about 200 people come through the doors. It was absolutely amazing. Two years after that, I thought I would go for something a little bit bigger. I created a show at St Peter's in the Forest, which is a lovely church on the edge of Epping Forest. The experience of curating that show and of course working with the artist, it was just so much fun and I'm really pleased I did it. For any artist 
thinking of creating a show who hasn't created a show before, which was a bit like me. This arts trail allows you to do that. You have a great audience who wants you to do well. I'm really glad I did it and I'd recommend for any artist to create a show. It's funny, that initial arts trial in 2015, the impact it had on my career was that year that Danny Coop from the Walthamstow Village Window Gallery came around and he really liked the work. 18 months later, he offered me a show. That show had one of the pieces I submitted for the 2018 Royal Academy Summer Exhibition. It got in. That piece itself led me to selling all the artworks I had in my studio, so I was able to leave my office job. Not only that, people from the Cube Gallery gallery came, loved the work, and since then I've been selling artwork through the Cube Gallery. So I'm kind of living my dream as a full-time artist. That chain of events would not have happened if I hadn't have taken part in that 2015 arts trail. Having the arts trail in Walthamstow, there's a lot of value to it. It's a great way to make friends, whether it's with other artists or with other residents. And I just think that's really nice. It makes Walthamstow a better place to live. For an able-bodied person, you might take off your shoes and socks and run through a meadow. For me, to paint and get my hands in the painting is like that. It's a very physical thing. I can get immersed in that world. My name is Nancy Willis. I'm an artist living here in Walthamstow. My greatest love is drawing and painting. I love printmaking as well. In the course of a day, which is all made up of endless, tedious details, making a piece of art is my chance for all that stuff to go away, all those anchors and shackles, to chuck them all out and to have that moment of joy. Even though it becomes harder and harder for me, because I have a progressive disability, I still seem to have to find a way to move paint around on paper. A lot of disabled people became part of a movement to challenge the darkness of disability imagery. That was a wonderful home for me. But we don't just want to make images that are bold and strong. I wanted to save room for more fragile feelings, fear or anxiety. I would feel I was only telling half the story if I were to leave out more painful, more delicate feelings. So I have to put them in. I've made an animation of this little shaky animal. I tried to make it walk a bit like I used to walk when I was little. So it's a kind of little animal version of myself. And it's something about feeling fragile in this world. I have done a little bit of filmmaking before. My film is called The Daring Young Girl on the Flying Trapeze. It's from a childhood visit to the circus. I was captivated by watching the trapeze artist. In a way, my art has become like that. That image of freedom and soaring, art has been that for me all my life. I've taken part in the art trail three times. People were very, very responsive. I was touched by what people said about the work. It was lovely to be seen in that way. In my early life as an artist, I just needed to make the work. But as the years go by, I realised that there is a joy in letting it actually be seen, and especially as I get older, I think, let me grab the chances. It's something special that I've discovered not just to express something, but to be able to hear how other people feel about that. That's why I thought that this year, let me do it. Let me join in and be part of it because the art trail is like throwing open the window and shouting out loud. I've loved it before, so I want to do it again. Hi, 
I'm Tim, and this is what I do. I'm a cartoonist and illustrator. I draw all sorts, I draw animals, people, anything really. This one is my comic strip called Live and Let Fry. I show children how to draw cartoons using step-by-step -step cartoon templates. I hold cartoon art workshops with the objective of creating something amazing that children can do in a short space of time. This is wonderful for the parents and this is wonderful for me because they make it look so easy. I'm going to draw a cat. I like drawing cats, so I'll draw you one. I'm a bit of a child myself. Fun and games is important. It's born out of creativity. I did the art trail in the library two years ago. I wanted my workshops to be free and I wanted them to be accessible. Accessibility is very important to families from all walks of life. Whether children are disabled or not disabled, when children learn to draw, they see how easy it is when you actually know how to draw. It's all about having fun. Children judge you at face value. They talk to you as if you are respected. Because you respect them, they respect you. I would encourage people to take part in the E17 Art Trail. The Art Trail is an opportunity for my art to evolve. It's given me a lot of confidence. I've met a lot of people. Exposure is very important. Once you create something, it's not going to sell itself. You've got to get it out there and get it known. Disabled people, deaf people, find it hard. Any exposure they get from something like an art trail is great. Do take part. It's a great opportunity to be a part of something much bigger, to celebrate culture and to find exposure. It's a great thing.
When I realized, are we going to get a second wave, we're going to get a third wave, um, you know, it's become completely impossible to predict anything. Lockdown happened and we couldn't film anything. I got really sick, Darcy got really sick. Because we've been furloughed, we've kind of had the breathing space to kind of be like, okay, so we can't do the stuff that we were gonna do, so how about we just start doing some random other stuff? In terms of doing digital art, I do um, mostly concept art. These ones, they've got hair made out of burnt matches, so they suddenly become really, really brittle. And it sort of sat there in the back of my mind, and I suddenly went like, oh yeah, sure, of course. I'll draw some drawings on printouts of graphs of how many cases and dead people of coronavirus are in different countries. This was the very, very first one. Um, and it was, it was quite funny. It's, I called it green fruits. It's blackberry, um, blackberries. And just on that day, there was some bullshit from the chancellor about, oh, we can see the green fruits of the economy. And I went like, yeah, right. <laughs> I guess I've adapted to COVID times and shot virtually. I started photographing the screen with my analog camera and Polaroid and film, just anything I could point my camera towards the screen. And uh, I just got people involved from all over the world who would lend me their hand. As a way to sort of make sense of what I was seeing, I started to make these drawings. I start with one image and then rotate the canvas so this is our main living area and Harlan has actually um, launched his book from here. The water does not move forward, only the shape of the wave. You know, we're, we're in this digital age now, but the fact that it was in a news and a broadsheet newspaper, um, it, it felt like I'd, I'd kind of arrived. It's a very human thing to want to feel connections. Community is so important as artists. With creative events, if people are inspired by what they see, you know, it's nice to offer them some uh, opportunity to try it, to try it out. The first year that I was here was the art trail, and um, through the art trail, I went into various people's houses and wandered around the neighbourhood and began to feel that I really belonged here. All of our production is, is based upon an interaction with other people. We're a social species, we, we can't exist on our own. Denied access to my studio where all my tools and materials are. Denied access to Inky Cuttlefish Studios where my friends and fellow artists gather. I've had to retreat to my front room. The Earth Issue is a collective of fine artists who um, intersect uh, environmentalism and fine art. You can see this work by uh, Moki about being quiet because suddenly, I don't know if you guys all felt it, but the world seemed quiet. Bees bumble, fumble, putting me to shame. Procrastination's now my middle name. Loads and loads of people who are living on their own had been got ill and been told to stay in and they didn't get very good advice and then weeks later they were discovered dead and decaying in their flat and I thought this is really horrendous, what kind of a world are we living in? And I thought lots of people are really desperate for a hug. So I made this little dolly. She's dressed in somebody's um, dressing gown sleeve. So she's kind of in bed, she's got her nighty on, and she's having to hug herself because there isn't anyone else to hug her. And I just wanted to give her a bit of love and say, I think it's really, really terrible that so many people died like that. Hello, everyone. Using reference before you go to draw anything is really important. This is my workshop. Please come in. Printed veil, looking at culture, identity. The balcony became our social distancing rehearsing room. All I need to take my photographs is my flatbed scanner, which attaches to my computer. It's also really nice to be around so many like-minded people. It's the Windrush generation. Hicks, call to the motherland and the contributions that was made to Britain. This is the Three Valleys Male Voice Choir, pre-lockdown. And here we are online, in lockdown. The 
project's been um, across Waltham Forest, but it's really brought lots of different people together. And I think even on the simplest level, it's a really great way to get people talking to their neighbours or talking about ideas of projects related to the book. No, no I don't think I will, said Grandad, smiling. So. The story, as you know, is very intricate. It's, it's really special and really beautiful. So we wanted to be able to create a certain page. And the page is the page of the jungle. And we decided to use dance to be able to bring that forward and, and make it real. My favourite part of Grandad's Island is when they go on a massive holiday on a massive ship going through seas of rooftops. I think that's also something that families, uh, you know, even if it's more of a fantasy, that they could travel to those places. And I've seen so many, you know, people's ideas and the inspiration they've taken from the book and what they've done with it. To see this, the breadth of those interpretations and how people take one element that's in the book, such as the parrots or the, you know, the colours, and then turn that into something of that, that, that's relative to their own experience. Good morning, thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. That's been one of the most rewarding things that I've seen. I've been working with Willowbrook Primary School, year two students, almost 100 pupils, and we've been using the book as inspiration for a soundscape. In the book, um, with there being a relationship between the grandchild and their grandfather, I think that's a really good way of like getting the readers to talk about their relationships. There's always one of those relationships in a family across two generations. And so um, I think it would be very powerful emotionally for families to, to talk about those sort of relationships. We invite families to come and make music with us to, through music, reflect what the park is, what it means to them, what the community means to them, and bring that together through a language that goes beyond words. I think art and creativity is the most important thing because I think it's all about confidence and fun. It's been fascinating and really humbling actually from my own experience to see it because when I created the book I never envisaged that this is the kind of thing that would happen. All eyes are on Walthamstow. You know that Londoners work hard and that they want more things to do at night that are not based around traditional nighttime economy. Lots of shops are opening up late. Just encourage people that wouldn't always come out, not just do their weekly shop. It's a good way actually to introduce ourselves, meet the locals and uh, tell more about our food. We want to be able to support London's high streets and small businesses the best way we can offering something alternative and interesting and interactive for people to get involved in. We went out and got out some money knowing there was going to be lots of things that we might want to enjoy. The children have been making lanterns. We are celebrating Christmas with a festival from West Africa. To make the high street feel like a nice place to walk down at night time because it can feel a bit lonely and not very safe and this is really nice. You know, it needs more activity, make it more of a heart for the, for the centre. It's great to be able to live here and then socialise and go to restaurants here. And it's just to improve the area a bit more, isn't it? That's a good idea. There's a lot more people here than earlier today. I've been trying to link artists up with businesses so they complement each other. We're doing a block printing and gift wrapping workshop. I might keep it as is. It feels a bit too nice to wrap up. <laughs> For it to be busy at this time, it just shows that, you know, it's needed. I'm making silhouettes of people out of um, photograms. It's really nice to see people that I was growing up around as well as new people coming across. I wouldn't normally come around this area a lot. We would do a colour walk hey. down to hey. the Sue Rider shop where Galena from Gigi's will be doing a talk. People are really busy all day long so this felt for me really special for people 7 o'clock and people still shopping. I'm getting things that yeah, I wouldn't buy normally. Because we're not so busy in the evening, 
and um, events like this takes place in the evening, you know, it gets us very busy. Just found out a whole lot of new places here that I hadn't actually realised were here yet. The Window Gallery is a concept where I think artists take it over as like a pop-up experience. There's so many people that they didn't know about the book cafe, for example, they came tonight. Lovely, lovely. We're really grateful for the opportunity given to all of us artists and businesses. Tonight we'd be running the beer tasting events as we brew our own beer just around the corner. The Create Space came about. It's been superb because we kind of, you know, discuss all the options. We've had like, I'd say about 70% increase of footfall here. This place can really thrive when they've got events like this going on and the, the uh, later opening hours would really just encourage more people to come to this area just for longer extended periods of time. So after the alfresco dining, we've organized an additional thing. But this has been absolutely great for all of us. I would definitely do this again. You know, I've been chatting to loads of people here tonight who have come specially for this who don't live locally. So that shows that there's potential. We're going to be watching it. We're really looking forward to seeing what the results show of nudging those hours. This is an important part of the development of London as a 24-hour city. Lockdown saw me relocate to live with my mother in a small village near Milton Keynes to help out with my sister who lives in a care home and who almost died, but she did make it. This is where I work. A lot of music happens in here. I will sing joy. I'm here standing with you. Hoist up the John B. I'm staying in has its own COVID NHS inspired art gallery created by the local children. It also has a locked up tiny library. The village has soundtracks. Here's the one for the NHS. Like many in lockdown, I'm on a continuous learning curve, which includes having made this sing-along film for the Outward Choir for people living in care homes. As a freelance musician, I'm the musical director of two choirs. Here's Wave Choir pre-lockdown in collaboration with the Royal Court Theatre in Langthorne Park. online with the world on our shoulders. This is the Three Valleys Male Voice Choir, pre-lockdown, with Jane, their accompanist. And here we are online in lockdown. Part of my job is teaching piano. Here's the online piano recital with my students and their families from all over the world. And this is what online piano lessons are like. Yes, that's it. During lockdown, the male voice choir lost Tony Moore, one of their founder members. The choir lined the root of the hearse to pay their respects. We also did a minute silence during rehearsal. In lockdown, it's been the silences at the corner of the room. It's been the space between words. 
It's the sound of sirens and helicopters and the loss of loved ones and the fallout for families. It's meant loss of income and the struggle to make ends meet. It's been queues, masks, panic buying and clapping for the NHS and frontline workers. But it's also meant deepening connections, a lessening of the raw of us and, finally, a space to breathe. Hello everyone, welcome to my home and my home studio. My name is Sharon Foster of Alicia Dean Artworks. I wasn't really affected by not going out during the pandemic because I work from home anyway, uh, but I did miss my friends and family. Um, I only had one art project for June, so I decided in March to decorate my flat, which uh, was actually a really big job. I also decided to catalogue and archive uh, past works that I'd had in exhibitions. Um, and then in May, um, George Floyd was murdered and that really shook me and stopped me from being um, at all creative. This is the way to my studio. It's um, a boarded up loft and um, I access it from these stairs. This is the entrance to my loft studio and my cat Kyla. Um, I've tried to organise everything up here as best I can. Some in boxes, some old art books are still out. I also catalogued uh, some of my other artworks and um, stored them properly so that if I need to take them out again for future exhibitions they'll still be in good condition. Um, it's pretty good lighting up here um, so I can come up here and I do a lot of painting up here as well. Also I do my scraper board etchings work. This piece was for an exhibition at Rich Mix the title was The Windrush Generation. It depicts the call to the motherland and the contributions that was made to Britain and also its hostile environment once they got here and the sacrifices they made and the trauma that they must have endured by leaving their children behind. And this is one of the scraper boards. It's a board covered by plaster of Paris and um, Indian ink on top. And what happens is you scratch away the black to reveal the picture within the white. I've come back down into the living room because this is where I do all my work on the laptop and I do line art through a Photoshop program and I produced um, images like this with and deeper symbols either as earrings or necklaces or somewhere around their person. I also developed a character called Boohoo and uh, using my daughter's eyes and my lips and this was in response to um, people at work always asking me why did I have a different hairstyle every day. So Boohoo has 365 hairstyles for 365 days of the year and it's just a black thing. Um, I also sent the image off to go onto mugs and um, I sell all of those as merchandise in my Etsy shop. Uh, that's the end of the video. It's the first time that I'm actually making a video with uh, my mobile, so I hope it's okay. And um, it's been a little bit 
uh, serious because that's just the mood I'm in because of the times that we're in at the moment. This short film was made by Sharon Foster of Alicia Dean Artworks for E17 Art Trail. My name is Francesca Wilkinson, I'm a photographer and I've been living in Walthamstow for just over a year. So as you can see, my studio space is actually just my lounge. Uh, we rent an ex Warner flat in Walthamstow, very common buildings around here. So if any of you live in one, you'll know that they're quite small. But it's actually okay that I don't have my own studio or a larger space because all I need to take my photographs is my flatbed scanner, which attaches to my computer. I highlight botanical subject matter in my work and I've exhibited my photographs at the Royal Horticultural Society's art and photography shows. I describe the improvised technique of photography that I use as a sort of reverse lit digital photogram. The lighting effect of the scanner and the absence of depth of field give an almost three dimension to the flora. The earliest botanic photographs were made using processes such as the cyanotype photogram by English artists such as Anna Atkins in the early part of the 19th century. I'd like to continue this tradition but using the technology available to me today in my process. There is no element of chance in the final result, I've got full control over the composition of my subject. There are certain challenges with this method, for example, the size of my scanner, which is A4. If a specimen is too large for it, I'll photograph it in parts and then I'll digitally stitch it back together post-production. One day when I've got more room or maybe a separate studio space, I'd like to get a larger scanner bed and see how that might expand my compositions or what specimens I can photograph. One of the reasons that we moved to Waltham Forest was because of the amount of green space in the borough. It's also really nice to be around so many like-minded people who care about looking after the green spaces. We're so lucky we've got Walthamstow Wetlands and the Lee Valleys on our doorstep and also Epping Forest is just a 15 minute train journey away. Most of the specimens which I photograph are either from my garden here in Walthamstow or my parents' garden. I don't pick wild flowers. Sometimes I'll buy specific plants and there are a number of online companies that sell native wild flowers in pots. I'll then replant those in the garden. As I don't have a separate working space, the pandemic hasn't really affected how I work to be honest, but it has actually given me the opportunity to spend time reflecting on my work and to start some new projects and ideas. I'm currently working on a series highlighting the importance of woodland flora. Just 2.4% of the UK is ancient woodland, and when we speak about preserving it, I often find that the flora that those spaces support is left out of the dialogue. Woodland flora, which are markers of ancient woodland such as English bluebell or the wooden enemy, to me are as much a part of our cultural identity as, say, Stonehenge, or the architecture of our cities. And like those man-made structures, these natural ones are also irreplaceable. Thank you for taking the time to come and listen to me talk about my work and see my studio space. Um, if you'd like to stay up to date with the work I'm doing, you can follow me on my social media. Please visit my website as well if you'd like to. And I'd also just like to thank Artillery Works um, for organizing this virtual um, E17 open houses. Thank you. Which one was defining itself when the lockdown started? We did find a way though. I cycled the empty streets, strings and drums of my back. The world seemed so strange, as if a heartbeat 
had been skipped. Under the radiant sun, immersed between smells of flowers and garbage, the balcony became our social distancing rehearsing room. this feeling when you meet someone and you just know that's the one? When I met which one, I knew. One Sunday morning, surrounded by chaos, we realized we have, we a, have a story, story to, to tell. tell. We unpacked our memories, memories dreams and lies. We revive them in sounds. Our music celebrates the unbeatable spirit of freedom fighters. Cries your honest tears, converse with Rumi's secrets, dances naked in the streets, dives to the bottom of the ocean, searching for a forgotten pearl, and puts our relentless, relentless children, children to sleep. We weave our spells and cling to sanity in the midst sanity. of a pandemic. What, what does, does it mean, mean being, being alive? alive? We are which one? Are you hungry again? 